इंडिया लीगल स्टोरीज दैट काउंट हेलो एंड वेलकम टू अनदर स्पेशल रीड आउट फ्रॉम इंडिया लीगल मैगजीन एज यू नो वी आर द नेशंस फर्स्ट पॉलिटिकल लीगल इंडिपेंडेंट वीकली फोकसिंग ऑन कंट्रोवर्शियल इश्यूज ऑफ नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल इंपॉर्टेंस the video readouts we present to you regularly are the editorial team's choice of the most significant stories we believe should receive close scrutiny and wide circulation uh, you can watch them along with the visuals or listen to them as you would a podcast now in this week's readout we focus once again on what is an obvious subject for india legal the courts and gender bias This has been the subject of continuous debate on India legal programs broadcast on APN TV which is our sister concern as well as our web portals both APN portal and the India legal portal Now nowhere in this essay is the name of Bilkis Banu the gang rape victim whose child was snatched from her and the baby's head smashed by the culprits nowhere is she mentioned by name but this read out could well be about her because it concerns every victim the key question is have judicial pronouncements and decisions at various levels hurt or advanced the cause of women's rights and their liberation uh, from um, what 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 we call patriarchal fetters uh, now ruminating on this subject in the latest issue of india legal is swati garg she is a prominent advocate who practices in the supreme court as well as delhi's high court and she is a regular and invaluable contributor to india today sorry to india legal today's india legal uh, the sad fact is that that a series of shocking judgments prove that india still has a long way to go before it can be recognized as a gender sensitive state or judiciary for that matter indian courts continue to use language and reasons in their orders that diminish the offense and trivialize the victim's experience now this is swati's uh, considered opinion what what i just what i just referred to as henrik ibsen observed i quote him a woman cannot be herself in the society of the present day uh, which is an exclusively masculine society with laws framed by men and with a judicial system that judges feminine conduct from a masculine point of view swati notes that this quote from the famous norwegian playwright aptly portrays the current mindset of the indian judiciary given the kind of judgments that have been passed lately and and and, and i'll refer to some of these the latest is where a bail order passed by the sessions court in kozhikode granted bail to the accused on the basis that the offense of sexual harassment is not prima facie proven if the woman was wearing sexually provocative dresses how many times have you heard that one before and now, as if this is not shocking enough says swati garg and another order granting bail to the same accused in a sexual harassment case against a dalit writer the same court virtually exonerated him from all offenses under the sc st the schedule scheduled caste and scheduled tribe prevention of atrocities act by holding that it is highly unbelievable that he will touch the body of the victim fully knowing that she is a member of the scheduled caste and and untouchable good lord but wait there's more there's also the issue of courts imposing ridiculous conditions for bail of the accused including one in which the accused was directed to visit the house of the victim with a rakhi and a box of sweets and request the the victim to tie the rakhi to him with the promise to protect her to the best of his ability for all time to come and this despite a catena of judgments where the apex court our supreme court of the country has held that the conduct of the victim is irrelevant it does not matter whether the victim has in the past consented or whether uh, she behaved promiscuously or whether she behaved in a manner unbecoming of chaste indian women whatever that may mean the courts in india continue to use language and reasons in their orders that diminish the offense and trivialize the victim's own experience 
Swati writes that these adverse precedents set by the imposition of certain bail conditions in cases involving sexual offences against women take their toll on the victim and also act as a source of secondary trauma on them and it affects their dignity. The courts have been time and again asked to refrain from imposing irrelevant, freaky or illegal bail conditions but to no avail. Every few months we come across uh, that one order which not only shocks us to the core but also pushes the Indian judiciary back by a decade or, or more. These orders also tend to make the victims think long and hard before filing a complaint as they always fear whether it is they who will be put on trial or the culprit. Now Swati Garg is saddened by the reality that even today after more than 70 years of independence many courts are still proceeding with such attitudes totally oblivious to the problems posed by the thoughtless judgments passed by them. Now a case in point is the one where while granting bail to the accused on charges of rape the judge had imposed the condition that the accused shall register himself as a COVID-19 warrior and he was assigned to work at the COVID disaster management at the discretion of the district magistrate. In another shocking case, bail was granted to the accused again on the charge of rape on the ground of the conduct of the victim. These judges, or the judge actually in this case, observed that nothing is mentioned by the complainant as to why she went to her office at night, that is at 11 p.m. She is not objected to consuming drinks with the petitioner and allowing him to stay with her till morning. The explanation offered by the complainant that after perpetration of the act, she was tired and fell asleep is unbecoming of an Indian woman, so says the judge. That is not the way our women react when they are ravished, says Judge Saab. I can only shake my head. And Swati Garg does not rest her case there. She says there are also many more shocking examples where the judges have attempted to affect a compromise between parties where rape of a minor has been alleged and the accused offers to marry the victim. The social activists who have been working in this field for some time insist that no such condition or observation should be made by a judge which initiates or encourages a compromise that disparages and downgrades an otherwise heinous crime, thus indicating that such offences are remediable by a way of compromise <laughs> by marriage. Even though the Indian law under section 437 and 438 of the Code of Criminal Procedure grants the power to impose conditions while granting bail to the accused, yet the apex court of the country has already laid down these conditions in judgments passed by it and hence it is quite clear that imposing conditions like rendering community service in COVID hospitals or in any other institution, uh, plantation of trees, contribution to any particular charity relief fund etc etc is impermissible in law and further is violative of the right to equality and personal liberty as the accused is still presumed to be innocent during pendency of the trial and their guilt is yet to be adjudicated uh, by the court. Now another class of thinkers also states that the court cannot assume the role of a social reformer or fundraiser for activities and charities and impose conditions which have no nexus with the offence or relevance with the object of the bail provisions while deciding these bail applications. The reformers also contend that not only are such remarks unacceptable and have the potential to cause grave harm to the prosecutrix as the complainant is called if it's a female and society at large but they also hamper progress of society and adversely affect the thought process of today's youth. There, care must therefore be taken to ensure that judicial orders conform to certain judicial standards and impose only those conditions that are permissible in law and necessary steps must be taken to ensure that this does not happen in the future. It can also not be disputed that the root of the problem lies in ignorance and the lack of empathy. Hence it is imperative the gender sensitization of both the bar 
and the bench, particularly with regard to judicial empathy for the prosecutrix, again, this is a legal term for a female complainant, uh, needs to be ensured. There is also a need to train the judges to exercise their discretion and avoid the use of gender-based uh, uh, stereotypes. Um, and this is especially while deciding cases pertaining to sexual offences. Secondly, judges should have sensitivity to the concerns of the survivors of sexual offences without getting into the stereotypes that are generally encountered in the course of a judicial decision making. Like, now, let me, let me list some of these stereotypes. I'm sure you've heard them, but we can't repeat them enough. Women are physically weak. Women cannot make decisions on their own. Men are the head of the household and must make all the decisions related to the family. Women should be submissive and obedient. Good women are sexually chaste. Every woman wants to be a mother. Women should be the ones in charge of their children. Being alone at night or wearing certain clothes makes women responsible for being attacked. Women are emotional and often overreact to dramatize, hence it is necessary to corroborate their testimony. Testimonial evidence provided by women who are sexually active may be suspected when accessing or oh, sorry, when assessing consent in sexual offence cases. And lack of evidence of physical harm in sexual offence cases means consent was given. The list defining and demeaning women includes many more such gender insensitive attitudes. These are what the English language describes as shibboleths. Swati Garg reminds us that also that any condition that mandates or even permits the contact of the victim with the accused needs to be avoided at all costs and it must be ensured that the complainant is protected from harassment of any kind from the accused. The complainant also needs to be informed immediately that the accused has been granted bail and if there is any peculiar circumstance in which may require or which may require additional conditions for her protection then that must be taken into consideration. Gender violence is most often unseen, shrouded in a culture of silence and hence goes unreported. The causes and factors um, of uh, violence against women include entrenched unequal power equations between men and women that foster violence and its acceptability, aggravated by cultural and social norms, economic dependence, poverty and alcohol consumption. The Indian scenario where the culprits are, are, often, known as, uh, are often known to the woman actually, the social and economic costs of, of reporting such crimes are high. General economic dependence on family and fear of social ostracization act as significant disincentives for women to report any kind of sexual violence, abuse or abhorrent behavior. It can safely be said that the actual incidence of violence against women in India is probably much, much higher than the data suggests. And women may continue to face hostility and have um, to remain in environments where they are subject to violence. It becomes the unequivocal duty of a judge in this situation to abstain from manifesting bias or prejudice towards any group or persons on irrelevant grounds as judges play a vital role as teachers and thought leaders. It is their role to be impartial in words and action at all times. If they falter, especially in gender related crimes, they imperil fairness and inflict casual blindness on the despair of the survivors. As I said earlier, this could well be an essay on Bilkis Banu and her plight and her tormentors without mentioning her name. And I thank Swati Garg for taking yet another step in sensitizing our readers and particularly the justice delivery system to the evil that is so deeply rooted in our social structure and cultural ethos. This is your host editor Indrajit Badwar. Until next time, goodbye for now.
इंडिया लीगल स्टोरीज दैट काउंट